Okay, uh, going to our guest, Bob Fletcher, is a businessman, investigator, film producer, speaker, author, and all-around good guy. And uh, I'm not going to go over uh, his bio myself or even give you his website. I want him to do that because I like to have guests on and their maiden visit with us to describe how they woke up. And he woke up running right smack dab into the CIA. I woke up when the police were dealing drugs in the town where I lived and busting people who had them later. And then I spoke out and they threatened to kill me. So uh, that's how I found the rabbit hole. Bob Fletcher joins us for the balance of the hour. Bob, uh, great to have you on with us today. Tell us about yourself and how you woke up. Very good, and it's my pleasure. I, uh, uh, thanks a lot for having me on. Uh, and again, it's strange. Uh, you and I uh, m missed each other all this time. I should, it's my fault. I should have screamed at you, I guess, earlier, and uh, we could have uh, shared some airtime. Uh, as far as how I got started, it, it's absolutely mind-boggling, and I'm going to really have to abbreviate this. I love to tell the whole in-depth story, uh, but it takes so long that then it cuts into everything else that we might want to cover. Um, I had a toy manufacturing company in Atlanta, Georgia, and this is in the uh, mid-80s, 1983, 84, 85, that period of time. Um, I, uh, I manufactured puppets and uh, unique little baseball hats with the, the, the everybody seen them originally was my one of my ideas and that was uh, with the funny little animal faces on the front of them and all that stuff uh, and basically uh, doing very well we were expanding I had a retail operation and the, the toy is extraordinarily uh, my primary product was very very unique and uh, we were selling them uh, in giant numbers. I couldn't even keep up with it. And I ran into a guy in New York City at a giant mer mar marketing and merchandising show. And um, uh, as in those those shows where they have 35,000 buyers show up at these gigantic um, uh, exposés and I uh, uh, just gathering up business cards of people that uh, were interested in buying my product. And uh, basically, I would just gather it up, write a little note on the back, and put the card down with full intent to get back to them later on when I got back to Atlanta. I contact this one number that I look at on the card once I get back to my factory, and I look at it and I said, well, this is, this is my address. And I looked at it again, and I said, yes, this is my address. And then I looked at it more carefully, and I realized that it was a guy that had a, uh, an operation um, 100 feet from me in the same um, manufacturing play area. Uh, and I could hit it with a stone. So, wow, I thought that was pretty strange. Anyhow, to make that long part of this rather short, uh, apparently I had been targeted by this guy, uh, and I think primarily because the previous five years of my life, I had had a um, an international uh, marketing company and had actually been partners with uh, the... Um, uh, a, uh, um, Excuse me, the um, a a ambassador, actually he was the, the consulate general uh, for the country of Liberia. And we were doing business with West Africa, et cetera, et cetera. And that was a couple years prior to my toy company. So I found out much later that was the reason I was targeted. Now, when I say targeted, here's what took place. We are, um, uh, I, I merged my business with this guy. He owned two or three companies, a gigantic company, uh, or I say gigantic, was well, a large uh, uh, national company where he, he sold novelty watches uh, to 7-Eleven stores and things of that sort. You know, I'm talking $100,000 at a time uh, kind of contracts. Uh, so that was pretty big, and he employed a hundred people with that company. So I thought I'd kind of hit pay dirt. All of a sudden, I had this business partner with tons of money to do what I needed to do with my toy company. Well, the bottom line was this guy was a major covert supplier of weapons for the central intelligence operations worldwide, and that's his intent with my company and with the other company that he had, which was his watch company, was using them as covert fronts to 
to be wherever he wanted to be. In my case, he had a full intention uh, of moving and having myself function as a courier into Angola. That's where the African connection comes in. And uh, needless to say, it blew me away. Uh, the first couple of months was great. The money was flowing. This guy was going to do television advertising with my toys and uh, et cetera, et cetera. We were just going to go to the moon with what I was doing. Uh, however, when uh, one day uh, he said, we're going to have some visitors, I want you to meet them, they turned out to be General Heine Adderholt and General uh, John Singlob that people would meet a few years later in the Iran-Contra investigations. This guy was, uh, hit, by the way, his name, the, the covert operative's name is Gary Best, and his company was called Vista, and Vista International USA, and uh, even changed the name of my company to Vista. Uh, they, Long and short, how do, uh, why did you get out of it? Uh, well, in, in short, uh, eventually after meeting generals and finding out about what was going on, or at least finding out partially what was going on, like I say, he wanted to bring me in to function as an international courier. The downside, he says, was that if you talk to the wrong guy, you're going to be killed. I thought that was kind of negative compared to the positives. Obviously, the you just toys... wanted to sell toys above board in America and, and, and around the world and be a regular toy salesman. You got it. You didn't want to be a spy. Absolutely. Just blew my mind. And, I mean, these guys were coming in and out. We were getting telexes at that time. There was no email. It was telex time back then. We would get telexes that were coded uh, messages. And this fellow, Gary Best, would tell me that, uh, oh, by the way, this means one of our guys was just blown away over there. And uh, so this operation had fallen down. I had come in on telephone conversations where he was selling and putting together contractual agreements for 747 aircraft. Craft, uh, making as much as ten million net profit on these. Now you came into a high level operation. High level, unbelievably high level. Because I, after, after finally, I just said, "Hey, I got to get out of here." The guy owed me a quarter of a million dollars that he hadn't paid me uh, yet. Uh, I said, "Pay me up or give my toy company back." And he said, "You're out of here." And if you say anything about what you've learned here, uh, you, you're going to... What he did, he didn't say anything verbally. He reached in his pocket, his vest pocket, pulled his hand out in the shape of a gun, pointed it towards my far, forehead, and pulled the trigger of the pretend gun. Wow. St so, stay there. we got to go to break. you got to finish the story. Then we'll, This will be the first of many visits. And then we'll get into the weather weapons, all the other things you've been involved in and, and, and covered. Amazing. Amazing. Bob Fletcher's our guest. Everything we said came true. Everything we've done has been right. 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 BobFletcherInvestigations.com is his website. I should add, we uh, have a mutual friend, Emilio Estevez, who actually got Charlie Sheen into, quote, conspiracies. Now, that's who uh, got Charlie into it, and I've you know, met him quite a few times and hung out with him. Great guy, really smart. He was looking at doing a story of Bob Fletcher's life. And why I've never had Bob on to now, I'm still marveling, but I don't want to burn the time up uh, repeating that. Obviously, we'll catch up on the 17 years I haven't had him because uh, he's, he's such an interesting fellow. Finishing up your story and abbreviating it, then we'll get into the weather weapons, all the other stuff you started discovering after that since then, and what you think uh, of what's happening today with Obama and uh, all the, the big developments. Bob, please continue. Okay. Yes, again, like I say, we have to really I kind of compress the, the, the front end of this thing uh, in terms of what happened. Uh, so here I am. I'm sitting in um, uh, my own toy company has now been taken over. The contracts are done. This guy technically owns it. He hasn't paid for me, paid for the uh, the agreement yet. But and he said he owes me a lot of money. The bottom line was these the things that were going on were just so far over my head, and I was just uh, 
you know, again, I had done an awful lot in my life prior to this, so I certainly didn't consider myself to be naive. Uh, and, uh, I mean, so much, uh, that's another whole story, too, which included being in the music and record business. For many years, I was an executive with MCA Records. I was the promotion director that introduced Elton John to the United States of America. I was on the road with the Who. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. This was my prior, long before I got involved with the, uh, my toy manufacturing. So, uh, again, I didn't consider myself naive, but as everybody else, I knew nothing about the, the unbelievable corruption at the highest levels of our country. And I, all of a sudden, was plopped into the middle of it. Now, first I thought, when I... I I just left. I mean, I, I, I left with a, a threat on my life. I said, I'm going to get out of here. I said, but this guy, I'm going after him. Uh, he's fooling with the wrong guy. So I get with my lawyer friend uh, right away, a friend of many years, and uh, a lady and her husband who actually used to work for me. And I, uh, I got with her, and I said, spelled out this whole thing. And she said, well, this is, you know, we just go in and file lawsuits against this guy and, and, and find out who the heck he is. Well, when I went first to, uh, and again, I have to compress this or we're going to run out of time. Uh, I, I went to, believe it or not, I called the CIA, okay? Uh, <laughs> you can't talk to the CIA. They told me that. I tried to set up an appointment with somebody. And I said, you are the guys that have to look into this. So they, that was nothing. That went no place at all. Uh, next point, I, I touched base with the uh, ATF, with the firearms people. I said, this guy, uh, this guy a couple of weeks ago threw the brochure on my desk uh, telling me this was something new that we were going to start handling. I thought maybe it was going to be a new toy. And it was a Hellfire missile. This guy was selling, putting together contractual agreements to supply the Hellfire missile to some of the covert operations at that time. He was in the middle of the Iran-Contra stuff. He was assisting General John Singlob, General Heine Adderholt, and General Richard Secord. And believe it or not, I met in my toy factory Bo Greitz. When he came back from one of his POW adventures, Bo came through the factory. I met Bo, and then, of course, later on, Bo and I end up speaking together on the same uh, uh, platforms, the same speaking engagements, and he, we became close friends, and he even ended up performing my wedding ceremony with my uh, my present wife. Anyhow, that's another whole complex, crazy story. But the bottom line was I left uh, a was unable to get any place with finding out who this guy was, you know, who he really was. Nobody, obviously, no cooperation. Uh, a, a year later, approximately 1986, 87, I see the Iran-Contra stuff is starting to be investigated. Senator John Kerry's people investigating. And I, uh, I'm watching the TV, and I heard a name or two, and I said, these are the guys that were in my toy factory. So I called up, believe it or not, just called straight in, dialed in, and uh, I contacted uh, Senator John Kerry's office. And I said, um, uh, I, I, these people that you said you didn't know who they were, I know who they are. So one thing led to another, and I became involved with the Iran-Contra investigations. I was uh, interviewed as a witness, and I became a federal sworn witness in the Christic Institute's legal action against all of these armed smugglers. You're a brave man, Bob Fletcher, uh, joining us here today, and we'll be right back and get into the latest info with him. Always really enjoy the information that we get from folks who've been fighting tyranny 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And Bob Fletcher's been doing it since the mid 1980s when he ran smack dab into it. You know, people that are ignorant who don't look at the info, they sometimes say, Are you sure there's a corrupt shadow government? Which now it's out in the open. But are you sure? And it's the things I've seen, the things I've witnessed. Oh, yes, it's real. 
And, you know, here's Bob Fletcher, the same thing, Iran-Contra witness, all of this. Uh, to make a long story short, any other points on that? Then let's get into your journey of then discovering this whole shadow system and where that's led you today. And what is number one on your radar right now, what some of your new investigations are, what you're most concerned about? Well, okay, sure. Let's just kind of, uh, yeah, like I said, the, the front end of this thing is amazing, all the ins and outs and everything, which, by the way, I've done it. It's, uh, I'm finalizing a book now, and all I'm going to need to do is get a publisher. That may be a trick. I need to get somebody to help me out on the publishing side because my book is now finally you know, down to uh, finished. Um, and I'm talking as of maybe two weeks ago. Um, the uh, and, and the rough draft of that is what uh, Amelia Westerman had looked at. And, uh, and his initial statement was that it was the greatest thing that he had read in five years. But he uh, vanished on me. Uh, and I'm not sure. I think maybe there were some na names in the book that were maybe close friends to uh, uh, to Martin Sheehan, his father, or whatever. But uh, um, I don't know what happened there. But dropping that off, though, we, um, I started chasing this. I realized that these guys were directly involved. Uh, this is 1987. Uh, they were directly involved with the Contra stuff. Uh, I started um, uh, contacting and making contacts with the investigators there. Uh, little by little, what was happening, how I um, uh, morphed into uh, doing all of the investigations, I was blown away every week as you have been by by finding out uh, who these people were and finding out the same guys that did Air America during the war, way back in the, the Vietnam War, these were the guys that were doing and supplying covert weapons. Uh, they considered themselves suppliers of air, and what they meant by that was transportation aircraft, helicopters, and that type of thing. But in the midst of this, of course, was uh, the supplying of all of the weapons that go into all of the little, tiny, unrecognizable wars that we carry on over and over and over again worldwide. It's a very small group of guys that uh, are always available, the same as there's a small group of assassins that are always available to remove problems from the scene. So a telephone call will come in and a guy will pick it up and they'll simply say, we've got the, a problem we got to solve, and these guys will go out and eliminate whoever it is that they want to eliminate, or they have to get weapons to an area, they will call these same specific guys and just say, we are, we're going to start functioning in Angola. And we're going to start functioning here and functioning there, and they set up the necessary secret weapons, etc. And uh, I was finding out on a regular basis that the guys that I dealt with yesterday that I was chasing were some of the same guys that I was going to deal with next month, and that they were all interrelated. And it ended up that all of the investigations that I've done in the over the, the last 25, 30 years, um, I ended up being physically involved one way or interconnected one way or another with what I was looking into. And it was usually, it all went back to these same characters that were in Bob Fletcher's uh, toy company. And uh, tell folks what happened to Sonny Bono. Sonny's situation was, during this period, again, from from the 80s up through the 90s and up to the 2000s, um, I was involved with many, many inquiries that the Senate and the Congress were carrying out. I dealt with uh, Dante Faisal as it related to the old October surprise inquiries. Uh, I supplied them with material that Barbara Honecker had given, given me after being unable to do anything, I was involved with that in inquiry. I was involved with, I did do a thing on the GF, JFK murder because I had gotten some actually footage from a central intelligence agent way back in the 80s. What was happening, my name was banging around in the corridors of the Congress and the Senate as somebody that knew this or knew these guys or knew what was going on. Sure, and they wanted to use you as a conduit to put stuff out because they knew you had the courage to do it. And, and, 
right. And yes, that's right. Absolutely. And also they were coming to me and saying, what do you know about this? Do any of your people fit this or fit that? I was even hired by Manuel Noriega's lawyers to do an investigative report for him. And what they were looking for was the connections between uh, him, uh, Manuel Noriega, after he was captured, the connections that he had previously had into the White House and, and other government levels. I did do that report. I was paid by the lawyers, but uh, they ended up uh, actually not doing anything because uh, they were also in bed with uh, some of the bad guys that, that I was reporting on. I was asked by Arlen Specter to do a report on the Oklahoma bombing because when I testified before the United States Senate Intelligence Subcommittee... See, that's what's crazy. I forget to say I've seen you on C-SPAN. Folks, this sounds... All of this is true. I mean, Bob, I guess in 30 years of fighting tyranny, you have seen so much. Everything. Everything. And just... And like I said, it went from one to another, and they were always some kind of an interrelationship. It was either with a, an event tied to an event or people that did A and B were doing C and D. And then sometimes the people who are actually doing the crime have somebody investigating it because they want to have an investigation and look like they were looking into it so they can spin it and then use it against other people, and they're all blackmailing each other. I've had high-level former you know, f famous spies and others tell me generals tell me jones the reason you're alive is uh because you know the system in a way finds it entertaining and it's almost a way that everything's just fleshed out so they can look at it from different perspectives but there's so many different camps involved no one wants to kill you because you're so well known then that can be used to be uh, blackmail against them so so uh, the, the way it's been put is there's too much paperwork there's no question about that. That's absolutely, you're right on with that. Now, there have been a couple of attempts. One guy, one time, when I was in the middle of the Iran Contras things, uh, et cetera, doing exposés relative to that, a guy drove um, a station wagon through my sliding glass doors and, and missed killing me by three feet in my office. That's their favorite way to kill you. Well, I was about to say, if it's a certain case where you've got original data that can get them, that's when they kill you. That's right. It is, it is, yeah, right, and there's also different ways to, to do it, and there's two or three other events, but we'll talk about that some other time. But on Sonny's case, I had delivered, uh, as a matter of fact, it, it was related to, originally, the uh, um, I believe probably one of my journeys to uh, Washington, talking to um, some of the Dante Fisel's people, doing or, or, or Henry Gonzalez, I did things relative to the finances when he was um, connected with the investigating some of the financial garbage going on. Uh, he was a congressman out of Texas. Uh, anyhow, to um, the bottom line was somehow we crossed paths, I crossed paths in Washington with uh, one of uh, the guy that ran Sonny's offices, Sonny Bono. And uh, uh, I told him I was working on this major thing connecting the CIA and drugs. Now, this was after uh, the uh, Waco events and all of that stuff. Sonny had become so traumatized when he got up to Washington. You know, again, he knew about corruption, but he was destroyed when he started finding out how high it went and how it deep it went and how extraordinary it was relative to billions and multi-millions of dollars. I'm going from memory, but didn't he break down and cry over Waco Absolutely. and stuff? Yes, and, yes, he did. And I remember watching him on C-SPAN because I was addicted to C-SPAN at that time, and he was really starting to get in people's faces, and you could tell he was freaking out that he yes. was in the middle of a bunch of crooks. Yes, yes, he did. He actually broke down and cried. Uh, you know, you can look at that from two sides. Um, his life and mine were so terribly familiar. I did things in the record business that he did in the record business. Uh, he, of course, became much more famous. Uh, but nonetheless, he and I ran down uh, mutual railroad lines side by side, like you and I. But anyhow, to get to get back to what took place there. So I told um, the 
then he was looking into the narcotics, et cetera, and, um, uh, and of course, Maxine Waters was doing her theatrical thing relative to it on the floor of the Congress, screaming and yelling about the connections. Uh, so I... At that time, now, I was in living in Los Angeles. All right, this is early 90s. Um, I had moved to, to L.A. Uh, and Congressman Waters' offices were right close by. I contacted them, and I said, I'm going to finish this report in a couple of weeks. I'm going to give it to you. And, uh, and I said, now, this names names that you're not going to want to talk about. You know, and uh, they said, which, of course, I heard that before. They said, oh, we don't care. Wherever the chips fall, you know, in the name of honesty, you know, and I thought, yeah, ha, ha, on that one. So I supplied her with a copy of this, her offices, and I supplied Sonny. Now, Sonny took a couple of months. In that interim period of time, uh, Waters uh, slowed down and was no longer screaming and yelling about the narcotics being supplied to the streets of America by our um, high-level government. Somebody had gotten a message to her because she was on the news before that, I remember. Right. Uh, she was going and confronting the CIA director, um, Mike Rupert was. Uh, right. That was big news then. Right, and Mike and I are good friends, too, by the way. But, okay, so we do. Um, uh, so she did nothing. As a matter of fact, part of that, believe it or not, something that was missed, uh, but Greenspan, Alan Greenspan, visited her, walked the streets of uh, her backyard in California, in Southern California, and promised her $100 million, if I remember right, financial assistance. Now, I don't know where the heck he's supposed to get that assistance, but they got an awful lot of community assistance exactly in this period of time. I'm talking within a couple of weeks of what I'm talking with the report, and that was the end to her. She never complained anymore. So um, not to say that that was directly related, but it's very possible. And for those that don't remember, the inner city areas were turned into war zones when the CIA started bringing the crack in, and there were actual people so drugged out they wouldn't eat or even drink that looked like zombies with all their hair falling out. I mean, literally, because I grew up in Dallas and saw a lot of these, uh, they look scarier than actual you know, fake zombies in movies. So, so I could see why she was wanting to get the drugs stopped being shipped in, but I mean, that's like putting a Band-Aid on, on an axe wound uh, to say, oh, here's $100 million for community stuff. Yeah, I think actually she wanted to just get the credit I don't know whether she really had a, a lot of care for that, but uh, for that area. Okay, so I supplied my report to Sonny, and by the way, which is one of the ones that I have available at my website, and that's the one on, uh, it's titled uh, uh, government, uh, excuse me, it's titled the CIA and drugs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I supplied this in a DVD form. Sonny finally got to look at it. He got back to me. I received uh, uh, an advance uh, information that Sonny had gone over it. He had freaked out and was moving forward to initiate a congressional inquiry based on primarily what I had supplied him with. And there's specifically a few people that he wanted to go after. I said, great, let me know how that happened, what's going on with it. Another month went by or whatever, and I, I received the call uh, right in the middle of December, uh, and uh, I was told, uh, Bob, Sonny has it all set up. In three weeks when he comes back from the Christmas holidays, we're going to begin the inquiry into all these all these characters and everything that's going on. We want to make sure you're going to be a witness and that you will assist us to go from there forward. I said, absolutely. I'm in Los Angeles now, but when you need me, you let me know, and I'll be in Washington, and let's go and do it. And the big deal was that Sonny had said that they were going to, they had set up subpoena powers for the congressional inquiry. Now, this may not mean anything. It's just a word to a lot of people. But the bottom line is that commonly with all of these inquiries that are by Congress and Senate, they're 
shut down all the time. They're sidestepped. We are lied to. They come in. They have experts that come in and sit on the committees. They know how to shut up everything. Well, here's an example. The TSA ordered Congress not to have all these top forensic security experts testify, proving their machines are frauds and it's all theater. And, and they tell, that was in the news the other day, the TSA tells Congress and Obama tells Congress what he can and can't do. Uh, he, he tells Congress, hey, we're going to have a war and, and, and you're not over that. The U.N. is now. Yes, absolutely. So they, they, the total control thing by this time, is, 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 is just forget about it. Anybody that thinks you're going to get anything done, you know, like the idea of write your congressman, phew, give me a break. That's almost uh, a comedy routine. But let me get to, to the, the most upsetting thing in 30 years in my life, I think, was the Sonny situation. So what happened is he gets my he gets my report. They're going to move forward with the um, uh, subpoenas. Subpoenas means that they're going to be able to tell these people to answer the questions or do jail time for not answering the questions. That's the difference that Sonny had set up. He was going to be on this new intelligence committee. It was all, everything was set and in place. And uh, so I said, great. I, I wished them all a nice Christmas, and that was it. Um, uh, ten days after I received that telephone call, Sonny Bono was murdered on the top of the ski slopes. Period. End of story. When it happened, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, I just phew, totally freaked me out because the bottom line is I genuinely feel somewhat responsible for his death because I know the materials I sent to him and the phone call I had gotten 10 days earlier was was the, the last straw for the bad guys. They were in a position to either stop and, and actually they had to kill and terminate Sonny before he came back, which would have been about 10, 15 days after he, he was killed. The only, they only had 10, 15 days left. If they hadn't killed him and uh, where he was going to move forward with the investigation, the investigation would have been started and somebody would have finished it even if he had been killed then. Incredible, so incredible. Going back to Bob Fletcher of BobFletcherInvestigations.com. Finishing up with the Sonny Bono, because I want to spend a little bit of time with you. And then if you want, we'll have you back next week or the week after to really get into weather, weapons, and everything I originally wanted to get you on with. But I remember 93, 94, watching Access TV, people putting Bob Fletcher investigation videos on. And it was just, I was like, this guy's really credible. I've seen him on C-SPAN testifying to Congress. But then he's talking about weather weapons. That was just too far out for me. Now it's just, oh, the government's weather modifying, but it's secret. And it's everything Bob exposed. So I'm going to do a whole hour with him on how he knew all that. I've been finishing up with Sonny Bono's uh, murder. Okay, sure enough. Um, and I, like I say, we end up end up running out of time because this, because whatever we're talking, thirty years of crazy stuff here. Um, the um, so with Sonny's case, I called Sonny's office right away to uh, uh, my my longtime associate up there uh, for a few years, um, and um, he would not take my calls. Now, this is a guy I normally would eat lunch with in Washington. Uh, and so this is right afterwards. So then I knew uh, I was right. The worst situation had happened that he had been hit. Uh, so I started chasing it. And uh, I had done a, a profuse inquiry. It took me a long time. They were totally withholding uh, the um, autopsy reports, uh, which, which I guess I'm still the only guy that's gotten it. Um, uh, that's the, they're holding a little bit of it back. But the autopsy in reality uh, shows that he had, um, there's no way he could have run into the tree. Uh, that's all baloney. I got the footage of the area that was taken only a, a couple hours after he was found and all the rest of that. I did an extensive, uh, I've done a DVD report, which is available at my website also on Sonny's murder. But the bottom line, without getting into all the intricacies of it, uh, there's no question it was impossible for him to go fast enough. He was 120 feet inside.
side the uh, tree line where it was off of the ski run. Uh, he was up actually in the woods. What did they do? Like taser him and then drag him in and beat his brains out? Or what did they do? You know, that part I'm not positive. It's one of two things. Either they had a deal somehow to, to like, meet him. It's possible somebody told him they were going to give him information for his investigation, uh, meet him secretly there, or he was hit someplace else and brought up on a ski sled and then rolled over into the snow and dragged up against the tree. But he was pistol whipped on the right side of his head, probably by a left-handed assassin. Yeah. But well, they, they said on the news, Benazar Budo hit her head. She's on tape being machine gunned. We'll be right back. We're catching up on 17 years of me never having Bob Fletcher on air. We're tentatively setting him up for next Thursday in the third hour. He'll be on sometime with us next week, probably next Thursday. Uh, we have a special guest, by the way, on the Nightly News. Style. I'll tell you about that coming on the next segment. But... Um, Listen, for folks that aren't online and can't go to BobFletcherInvestigations.com and check out your films and materials and special reports there that are in text, uh, is there a P.O. box or some other way for folks to contact you? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, guys, grab up a pencil there. It's Post Office Box 216, Bayview, B-A-Y-V-I-E-W, Idaho 83803. That's... 216 Bayview, Idaho, 83803. And uh, drop us a note uh, if you're not online. We'll send you a little catalog, shows you what we've been doing. Wonderful. We've only got four minutes left with you, and you're on next week, graciously. Okay. Uh, 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 on the world today, on all the craziness, the NDAA, I mean, everything you talked about has come true. I mean, this is crazy. What's your view in the general world, where we're headed, what the New World Order is up to? Uh, well... It's going to be interesting because I'm I'm not sure they're having to mix uh, the crazy stuff that they're artificially put on us with some of the real changes of the earth, so to speak, that may put us into uh, dire emergencies. So between the false stuff that they're applying and the uh, real stuff that's coming down from uh, nature, uh, I don't know if they know what to do. But what's really spooky that I have not not investigated very much is the multitude of gigantic underground facilities that the bad guys have spent our money on yes. preparing for themselves to have a place to jump and hide when the stuff hits the fan. And so, uh, I don't know, it's putting them into a little trick bag. I don't know what they think they're going to be controlling if, in fact, everything's uh, blown up and flown apart uh, above ground. All right, well, the first thing we're going to cover then is weather modification and, and deep underground bases, which they admit they've built, but again, that's secret. The details are secret. Uh, unbelievable amounts of money there. What else are we going to cover next week? Well, we can talk about, of course, uh, I'll tell you something, that is some uh, brand new things that nobody's ever even, I've not even talked much about, is uh, the bombs, uh, the uh, Oklahoma, you know, we have the anniversary coming up in a couple of weeks on the Oklahoma bombing, and uh, I have connections that I will talk about for the first time uh, on your show relative to uh, what I've discovered on that. It's it's really, uh, it really freaked me out, and it's very real about who was involved with uh, some of that, uh, are the, the rest of the bombs. That they uh oh, you better say real quick and get the tells next week. We don't want you to die in a skiing accident. Just real fast, who? Oh, and, and um, Gary Best, the, the arms dealer that was in my company, I found out, had moved temporarily one and a half miles away from the bomb site and uh, had previously supplied electronic detonators for C4 plastics for the Contras. And he was in Oklahoma with a covert operation. Well, we, we know the head of anti-terrorism was there and got caught lying about it. Yeah, it well, and, of course, they did retrieve a couple of bombs that did not go off. Yeah, that was and, on the news. And they disappeared. Yeah, we have that all on video, of course. Well, uh, we can talk about that, and uh, go, or we can talk about some of the weapons that people just would not believe that we utilized and tested down in Panama. When we invaded the Panama, we did the Panama invasion. Super weapons. Right. Well, 
laser weapons that melted humans. And uh, we have some of that, on, unfortunately, on video, which is pretty disgusting. Yeah, I've seen that in the Panama deception. Wow. Okay, we're going to cover it all next Thursday. I'm going to call you in about 10 minutes to double check. You haven't been able to see your schedule yet. But next Wednesday, next Thursday, Bob Fletcher, full hour uh, to get into all the other stuff. Amazing. Bob, thank you so much for spending time with us. God bless you. Take care. I'll say bye to you right now. Uh, Bob Fletcher, Investigations.com. I'm Alex Jones with Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sinus Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there. Wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com.